we've covered the origins of the German and the English Bibles and the incredible opposition that they endured, but we've only scratched the surface, unfortunately. The same thing occurred for every translation that came into being during the 15th and 16th centuries. Since this class one day will be translated into Spanish and French, I want to cover that for our beloved brethren in those countries. And even though there was a spark of light and hungry hearts to receive in Spain and France, there hardly was any space of grace or any protection. So the opposers had the upper hand. The sparks of Wycliffe and other visionaries' light were spreading across Europe. They were igniting in country after country. But in Spain, this Reformation was brutally interrupted by the Spanish Inquisition. This Inquisition was so hideous that only a few scholars dared to translate the Bible into Spanish. Some tried, only a few reached the goal of the entire New or the Old Testament, and the Inquisitors hunted down the rest and erased them from history. In this session, we're going to illuminate the groundbreaking Spanish and French versions and honor those brave souls who endured incredible risks and overcame huge obstacles to forge from the cruel crucibles of their pains and persecution the pure gold of translations of the Bible in their mother tongues. They achieved these stupendous feats because of their determination and their unquenchable love for God and their countrymen. And in the new heaven and earth, we shall witness them, as well as the ones erased, openly rewarded for their heroic feats of genuine Christian faith, and they will get to see the effects that their labors have had on the world since. The first translation of the Bible into Spanish was done by Bonifacio Ferrer. He was a Spanish priest who lived about the same time as John Huss. His version didn't get printed until after printing was invented. It was printed in 1478, but it had scarcely been published when the Spanish Inquisition started up. It suppressed it. No copies exist today. Only four pages of it are known that were discovered in a monastery. The ecclesiastical powers would not tolerate a Wycliffe type of revival or a Lollard kind of movement in Spain. The next scholar's name was Francisco de Enzinas. His parents wanted him to become a soldier, but he became a biblical scholar instead. And he learned Greek. He moved away from Spain to Wittenberg, Germany, where Luther was. And he stayed in the home of Luther's assistant, Melanchthon. Now, Melanchthon actually was a spark plug for several European translations. And he encouraged him to translate the New Testament into Spanish. So he utilized Erasmus's Greek text, and he published the New Testament in Spanish in 1543. A lot of the copies were intercepted by the Inquisition. On November the 24th, he presented a copy to the Holy Roman Emperor in person, Charles V. This is the same one who had presided over the Diet of Worms with Luther, and he dedicated the book to him, and King Charles promised that he would support it if his Roman Catholic advisors okayed it. But instead, it was rejected, and three weeks later, Francisco de Enzinas was arrested and jailed for 15 months. His translation was fine. It was wonderful, except they objected to a few traits which they called Lutheranism. And that the fact that the passages dealing with justification by faith were printed in boldface type. And they didn't acknowledge the authority of the Pope. But before he could be tried and executed, he escaped to Antwerp, and he was ultimately appointed to be the chair of the Greek department at Cambridge University. Then there is something very unique that occurred. The next set of Spanish reformers and heroes all came from the same town in the same generation, and this pocket of light was about 80 miles due north of the Strait of Gibraltar in a city named Sevilla. And there was a monastery named San Isidro del Campo in Sevilla, and the prior of that monastery, Dr. Blanco Garcia Arias, 
was influenced by the teachings of the Walden scenes, which we'll go over in a little bit, Martin Luther, and he obtained a copy of D. and Zenus's Bible. And they shared this information with his monks at the monastery, and the entire monastery decided to quit the Roman Catholic Church and become Protestants. They spread the gospel throughout the surrounding area, and out of this one small spot arose scholars who translated the Bible into Spanish. First one was Juan Perez de Pineda. He was a Spanish theologian who was influenced by these monks. Prior to his conversion, he was the rector of the School of Doctrine. He was in charge of the School of Doctrine at the University of Sevilla. He became a Protestant, and when Dr. Arius was burned at the stake for Lutheranism, he fled to Geneva. And there in 1556, he translated the New Testament into Spanish. He also completed the Psalms the following year. Now, he never got to do the Old Testament, but he still was instrumental in its completion because as he lived his last years out under the protection of the Duchess of France, uh, Duchess Renée, he raised the money for the task of the translation of the Old Testament, and a trust fund was created when he died. This trust fund later was granted to one of the other translators to help him finish the translation. The next hero is Julian Hernandez. Now, this hero did not translate. He was a smuggler, a smuggler deluxe, who brought the Spanish Bibles into Spain. It was illegal to own a Bible in Spanish. So all of the early Spanish Bibles were designed small so they could be easily hidden. And he smuggled many Bibles in to the hungry Spanish believers. But he was betrayed and arrested, and for three years they tortured him, trying to get him to break, trying to make an example of him. But he would not recant. He never cracked because he was proud of the fact that he was helping his countrymen get the word. And he even told the inquisitors straight to their face that, that they finally burned him at the stake. Casadioro de Reina was from the same area in Sevilla. He attended the University of Sevilla and had been ordained a priest. And he was one of the 12 monks of that San Isidro del Campo monastery who had turned Protestant. Julian Hernandez had brought in copies of the New Testament by De Pineda, and the monks there read them avidly, but they were hunted down and arrested for being Protestants, and he and 21 others were going to be burned at the stake when he escaped, and he went to Geneva. There in Geneva, he decided he had two goals for his life. He wanted to translate the Bible into Spanish, and he wanted to be a pastor of a church. He was a, a very dynamic speaker. He became known as the Moses of the Spaniards. But there, the Calvinists were in, in Geneva, and they cracked down on some of the dissenters within the Calvinistic movement at that time. I think they even had one executed. And that really soured things for De Reina. And so he called them a new Rome. Pretty soon, they were tiring of his company. And so he, he escaped to London because some agents of the Inquisition were hunting him down there in Geneva. And King Philip, just like King Henry VIII had made an edict to try to arrest Tyndall, King Philip of Spain did the same thing for Casa de Reina. And so he escaped from city to city to city in Germany and France, staying one step ahead of his persecutors. And in 1566 or 1567, he, trans he finished translating the New Testament into Spanish, and he published it. And today, even today, this translation is hailed as the greatest literary triumph in Spanish history because of what he had to do to do it. After he finished the translation of the New Testament, he received the grant money from Juan Perez de Pineda. And in 1569, he published the entire Bible in Spanish. And for the Old Testament, he drew upon a literal translation from Hebrew to Spanish that was done by two Hispanic Jews. It's really interesting. The Inquisition, when it first started out, it was only against these Protestants. And the Jews were free to have a Bible. So the Jews translated the Old Testament into Spanish, and then, then the Inquisition spread, 
and started uh, getting after the Jews as well. The next believer was Cipriano de Valera. He was from the same area in Sevilla, and he was a fellow monk among those 12. He fled to Switzerland and thereafter to England. He studied at Cambridge. He taught at Oxford. He was brilliant. He was fluent in 10 languages. Just amazing. And also, like Tyndall, he wasn't just a geek. He grounded himself in the aspects of practical Christianity. He ran prison outreach, and he ran sailor outreach. He spent 20 years revising Casadioro de Reina's Bible and published it in 1602. And it became known as the Reina Valera Bible. And it's now the equivalent of the King James for the Spanish language. It was done with the same quality, the lofty, beautiful Spanish prose equivalent to what was done by King James. But King James was done by six groups of scholars. Over 50 people did the King James, and only two achieved the same quality in Spanish. Now, these translations were violently opposed by the Spanish Inquisition. They had the death penalty even if you owned one, and you were not even allowed to quote from it. And the Spanish inquisitors maintained that the Spanish Bible was the foundation of heresy. Unbelievable. Now, the Spanish Inquisition started in 1480, and it lasted 328 years. It was horrible. At first, it concentrated on stamping out Protestantism, or Lutheranism, as they called it. But like anything devilish, it took on a life of its own as the inquisitors tried to outdo each other, thug mentality, gang mentality, to advance themselves. They were determined to crush all opposition to avoid any of the Protestant wars that had occurred in England and France and Germany and Czechoslovakia once the word was made known. The word had that much of effect on the societies. And they were, they were determined it was not going to happen in Spain. So they crushed it. And pretty soon, as it took on a life of its own, pretty soon the Jews and uh, Christianized Muslims were included in the persecutions. They also censored books. Books and uh, booksellers were regulated. Uh, they made up lists of banned material called indexes. And then any books that were on the list were either burned or expurged, where they had a process where the offending language was blotted out with black ink. And it even got to the place where all ships coming into town were, were searched. It even got to the place where inheritances were inspected for banned books. And the inheritor couldn't get the books until they had gone through the list and made sure that none of them were on the index. The chief grand inquisitor, his name was Thomas de Torquemada. He uh, was that for 18 years. He oversaw the execution by burning of 10,220 believers. Another 97,321 believers were punished with infamy, confiscation of property, torture, or imprisonment without parole. And they were so proud of these statistics that they kept the statistics. If someone turned someone in, it was called an auto de fe, an act of faith. It was also considered an act of faith to burn heretics. This not just occurred in Spain, but also in the Spanish holdings in America. The last general secretary of the Inquisition, when it ended in Madrid, affirmed that from the date that it started until it ended in 1808, the Inquisition executed 31,912 people and punished 291,456 people. There is a, a book that's written about this. And you know what I did when I did my research is, is I tried to digest information from all kinds of sources and put them together, but I could not digest this. So I put it in in quotes. The iniquity of the method of trial to which the victims were subjected was colossal. The proceedings were conducted in secret. The accused was kept in ignorance of the charges against him as well as the evidence on which the charges were based. The tribunal of monks had its familiars in every house diving into the secrets of every fireside, judging and executing its horrible decrees without responsibility. The accuser might be the own man's son or daughter or wife of his bosom. 
for all were required under penalty of death to inform the inquisitor of every suspicious word a man spoke. It was assumed from the first that he was guilty and every effort was made to force him to confess. Persons pretending to be friendly were allowed to interview him in order to entrap him into admissions and to frighten him with fictitious evidence. Then when worn out by solitude, suffering, hunger, and terror, he was exposed to the most cruel tortures, often fiendish in their ingenuity. The torture took place at midnight in gloomy dungeon, dimly lit by the torches. The victim, whether man or matron or tender virgin, was stripped naked and stretched upon the wooden bench. Water, weights, fires, pulleys, screw, all the apparatus by which the sinews could be strained without cracking, the bones bruised without breaking, and the body racked exquisitely without giving up the ghost were now put into operation. The executioner enveloped in a black robe from head to foot with his eyes glaring at his victim through holes cut in the hood, with his muffled his face, practiced successively all the forms of torture with devilish ingenuity of the monks that it had invented, and the imagination sickens when striving to keep pace with these dreadful realities. Then when they were executed, the procession that took place at the execution of heretics was known as auto de fe, act of faith, it was generally held on a Sunday, often on All Saints' Day. The tolling of a bell at dawn was the signal for the opening of the horrible pageant. Men of the highest rank, even the king himself, found it prudent to countenance it with their presence. The, the procession itself was led by the Dominicans, carrying the banner of the Inquisition in the van in the front, and then followed the penitents behind them, but separated them by a great cross came those condemned to death barefoot and clad in the San Benito, a yellow dress with pictures of devils drawn on it, with a pointed cap on the head, and then effigies of those who were condemned but had escaped, the fugitives. They were burnt in effigy. Lastly, the bones of dead culprits in black coffins that had died and later they found out were heretics and they dug them up so that they could burn their bones. Their coffins were black painted with hellish flames and other symbols, while an army of priests and monks formed the rear of the procession. If at the last any of the condemned professed the Catholic faith, they were strangled before they were burnt. Instead of being burnt, many were immured in cells or narrow niches made in the walls of the houses of Inquisition and kept there for years or for life. In 1312, for example, the penalty of being perpetually immured was inflicted on some 87 people. They were perpetually shut up in a cell the size of a chimney flue. Dr. Rule, in his history of the Inquisition, gives an account of walled-up victims, the skeletons of three of which were found in the convent of Santo Domingo in, in Mexico, and four in the Inquisition at Puebla. He mentions he found about 200 skeletons, were found in a long galley, and they found some places where there was a smooth wall, and they, they sounded the wall, and in some places that were broken out, and then they found this one part of the wall that was solid, and they sounded it with hammers, and it was hollow. And so they opened up the part of the wall, and to the horror of the explorers, four human skeletons met their view, one man sitting on a stone, two men standing, one woman laid on her back with a bundle at her feet, which contained an infant. The niches which held three out of the four were vertical and must have resembled narrow chimney flues, barely sufficient for a living person to stand upright and not wide enough to allow the body to fall prone when life became extinct. And they were sealed in those to die. Those were believers that just wanted to have a Bible, who just wanted to speak the word. In Spanish. These are the horrible, monstrous things that our brothers and sisters in Christ endured just for the sake of having a Bible or speaking the word in their own language. You know, today we can go out, we can read our Bibles in the park, we can go out into the open for anyone to see, we can speak the word and witness to people without fear of arrest or persecution. This freedom is not free. It was earned by the blood of our brothers and sisters in Christ who hungered for the word and stood up against the tyranny despite the cost to them and their families. 
But no matter how much Satan and his agents of evil tried to stop it, the movement of God's word was inexorable. Once the word of God was set free from the Latin Vulgate dungeon and made known to the people in their languages, it could not be stopped. Even with the hellish Inquisition, they couldn't stop people from hungering for the truth, and the Spanish Reformation ultimately occurred. Since then, though, another conflict is brewing. The King James Only Gang, remember those guys? Have spread their movement into other languages, and now they defame those who support textual advances of the critical Greek texts for foreign language translations. So the contention of truth versus tradition even occurs today. The Reina Valera version of 1602 was based on the Textus Receptus, and it underwent a number of additions with minor corrections over the years. And then after the new textual discoveries, especially Codex Sinaiticus, remember that Tischendorf discovered, and Vaticanus, Dr. Angel de Mora and Dr. H.B. Pratt published a major revision of the Reina Verera version in 1865. This Bible, which was based on the newer textual evidence, contained 60,000 word changes. However, because of the equivalent of the King James Only movement, the Textus Receptus Gang in Spanish, they objected to this new translation and their opposition grew to the point where a full revision of that work was made in 1909 and changed back many of the textual improvements to their equivalents with the King James Version. Another major reprint of this was done in 1960, which kept harmony with the received text instead of the new textual discoveries. The 1909 and 1960 versions of the Bible the Reina Valera version with the changes back are primarily used throughout the Spanish-speaking world today. It's just amazing, though, how the word had its effect. Once people heard it in their language, but man, what they had to endure in Spain so that they could read the word. Like the emergence of the European Bible, the history of the French Bible is baptized in blood and tears. To give justice to the staggering struggles that produced this version of the Bible, we have to digress to cover the Walden Seas, who was a historic race of believers that steadfastly held to their beliefs and stood and even fought against the tyranny and error, and they did so for centuries, in spite of being cruelly assailed by wave after wave of horrible persecutions. They finally were emancipated 300 years after the Reformation. At the top of Italy, you know how Italy is shaped like a boot, and at the top of Italy, as the boot spreads out to touch the sky of the Alps, on the western side, where the borders of Italy and France meet, are the Catane Alps, and next to them, on the north side, are the Dauphine Alps. And in these mountain ranges are beautiful, secluded valleys, where for centuries, believers were able to hold to their faith free from the controls of the Orthodox Church. Secure in their fortress-like retreats, they grew crops and tended their flocks, and they taught their children the word, and a form of Christianity was, which was untainted by the Roman Catholic Church. These believers were called the Walden Seas, or Valdois, by the Italians, or they were called Albigenses by the French. Uh, the name Walden Seas comes from the Latin word Valis, which gave us the English word valley, and the French and Spanish words valet, uh, the Italian word valdici. So the Roman church called them Valdenses or Waldenses. In Italy, that name became synonymous with opposers of Rome because the residents of these valleys had a long history of differences with the Roman Catholic Church. And then they got named all kinds of other things. Because they advocated purity, they were called the Cathari. Because they advocated humility, they were called the Humilati. Uh, because they uh, wore wooden shoes, they were called the Inzibati. Because that's the, the lower class people wore wooden shoes. They couldn't afford the leather ones. Because they were textile weavers, they were called Texarounds because they refused to observe the Roman uh, the uh, saints' holidays but observed the Sabbath, they were called Sabbath men. But they spread their beliefs to many European nations. Most historians date the beginning of the Walden Seas to the mid-12th century when a man named Peter Waldo came on the scene. But there's evidence that they were much earlier. 
it's well known that the conqueror will exaggerate history in their favor. And anything from the conquered that survives is usually exaggerated or inaccurate. These Walden Seas had documents that proved their antiquity, but they were burned in 1559, so they no longer exist. But in 1250, an inquisitor in Italy wrote against them, and he said, among all these sects which still are or have been, there's not one more pernicious to the church than that of the Leonists from Lyon, which is on the French side. And on these three accounts, first is because it is of longer duration. Some say that it has endured from the time of Sylvester. He was a fourth century bishop of Rome during the time of Constantine when that was when Christianity was legalized. Others from the time of the apostles. Second, because it's more general. There is almost no land in which this sect is not. Third, because since all other sects, by the outrage of blasphemies against God, produce horror in the hearers, this, namely the Leonists or the Waldenses, has a great appearance of piety, because they live justly before men and believe all things rightly concerning God. Therefore, they're heretics, right? They had a profession of faith, which is in poetic form, called the Nobla Lacone, but a lot of people think that it started in 1150 with Peter Waldo, but a lot of other scholars think that it went much earlier. And there's earlier evidence in 1059 when a papal legate was sent to the foot of the Alps to bring the believers in that area into the Roman Catholic fold, and it, it said that the church in that area has always been free without being subject to the laws of Rome. So that was in 1059. Earlier, during the 9th century, Claudius, the bishop of Turin. Now, Turin, remember where they had the Winter Olympics? That's in, at the foot of the Alps, right in the areas where these people live. And he tried to subjugate the people in the lowlands of the Alps, and they spurned him, and he was not as radical into the Roman Catholic things as most other people. He, he didn't believe in uh, the, the idols and the icons and all the other things, but they still spurned him. Even earlier in 590, when Gregory I became Pope, he pushed a number of doctrines which actually were, quote unquote, Roman Catholicism. Purgatory, the Pope was to be over all the church, the worship of images, the adoration of saints, festivals for the saints, the power of relics, and a number of bishops from this area in northern Italy refused to assume these beliefs. So they, they had a long history of the believers in this area. There's even record of Vigilantius in the fourth century, and church historians called him the Protestant of his age. He lived during the same time that Jerome lived. Jerome was the one who translated the Bible into Latin, the Latin Vulgate. And Jerome says that Vigilantius clamored with me in the Cotane Alps, and he wrote against Vigilantius, accusing him of opposing relics, prayers for the dead, the ceremonial use of candles, and celibacy. So the believers in this area had a long history of standing up against false doctrine. Now, Peter Waldo, he lived during the late 12th century. He was a rich merchant in Lyon, which was on the French side, and he was at a party and someone died right in front of him, probably heart attack or stroke or something, but just died right in front of him. And it shook him so much, he started wondering, well, what's, what's going to happen to me? And so he decided to get into the Bible. And so he renounced all his riches. He set up an endowment for his wife and children, and he organized the poor men of Lyon, and they were a band of lay preachers. But see, the problem was you couldn't preach the word without a license. You had to be approved by the local bishop. But see, these guys, they love God so much, they preached the word and they did a lot of wonderful things, but still they violated the rules. So Waldo went to Rome in 1179 to try to secure the right to be able to preach. But the Pope only gave him a blessing, you know, good boy but he didn't give him the license. See, he was forbidden to preach without permission from the local bishop, but Waldo and his, his band preached anyway. And pretty soon, they adopted heresy, unorthodox doctrines, and they were formally declared heretics by the pope. Now, a lot of scholars think that's where the Waldenses came from, but another group believed for an earlier origin, like some of the evidence that I shared with you. In 1208, Pope Innocent III, the third proclaimed a holy war against the French valley dwellers. 
And after he sent an army into the region and subdued it, the Inquisition began for them, and thousands of believers were burned alive because they wanted to believe the word. They wanted to believe uh, things like there had not been no, any true pope since Sylvester. The state of purgatory did not exist. The relics were frauds. Pilgrimages to Rome do not enhance one's salvation. Here's a good one. There's no difference between holy water and rainwater. <laughs> Here's a good one. A prayer in a barn is just as efficacious as one in the church. Uh, bread and wine do not change during communion. You know, that doctrine of transubstantiation. Waldo financed the translation of the Bible of the Gospels from Latin into French. Um, and so they got the word in their language. Plus, there's evidence that the Waldenses also made other translations. And see, this is from the earlier group, earlier than Waldo, where they translated the word into Italian, German, Northern Italian, Northeast Spanish, and French. These were all copied by hand because printing was not yet invented. Uh, they proclaimed the scriptures as their only rule of faith and practice, and they stressed memorizing it because of the inquisitions. They knew one day that someone might come into town and take away all of their Bibles. So each town broke up at the sections of the Bible and passed on the, the they um, memorized it. Each family was responsible for different portions and so that if it ever was taken away from them, they could recreate it from memory in the community. Um, one time there was this inquisitor that ran into a uh, Walden Seas pastor on a mountain pass as they were walking over the mountain and the pastor recited to him the entire book of Job in French and just freaked this guy out. It's unbelievable. And this pastor also knew of many who had memorized the entire New Testament. Uh, their worship services consisted of reading from the Bible, reciting the Lord's Prayer, and sermons, and they believed that any Christian believer could preach because all born-again believers had the Holy Spirit. Man, that was revolutionary back then. They did not have a hierarchical church structure like the Roman church. Instead, they had self-governing churches, which were led by a local pastor and a council of lay believers, and then all pastors with an equal, equal number of laymen from these local councils met once a year in a secluded valley in the mountains to maintain continuity and to refresh each other with the word taught in each other's company. Uh, they did missionary work in southern cent and central Europe, including Spain, France, Germany, Netherlands, Bohemia, and even Poland. They had missionaries whose commitment was for three years, and they served two by two. They maintained, these believers that were sent out maintained a secular trade. Usually they were merchants or peddlers and they found that they were welcomed as merchants when they might have been spurned as missionaries. And they carried handwritten copies of scripture with them, often written by their own hand, which they would teach from or give to converts. Now, there was an inquisitor who used to be a, 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 a believer for 17 years, and then he recanted and he rejoined the Roman Catholic Church, and they loved that. They made him an inquisitor because he was so familiar with the Walden Seas, and he wrote about what these believer missionaries would do. The heretics, as he called them, employ very cunning methods by which to insinuate themselves into the society of the noble and the great, and they do it in this way. One of them takes with them some suitable articles of merchandise, such as rings or dresses, and offers them for sale. And when they have bought what they choose, they ask the man if he has anything else to sell. He answers, I have more precious jewels than these, and I would give them to you if you promise to not betray me to the clergy. The promise being given, he proceeds, I have a gem so brilliant that a man may know God by it. I have another whose glow lights up the love of God in the heart of him who possesses it. 
and so forth, speaking of the gems figuratively. And then he recites some chapter of the New Testament in their language, such as the first of Luke, uh, where it talks about the angel Gabriel sent from God, or the Savior's discourse in the 13th of John, when he observes that his hearers are beginning to be pleased, then he quotes a passage from Matthew about the scribes and the Pharisees who sit in Moses' seat and woe unto you because they shut up the kingdom of heaven or woe unto them because they devour widows' houses. And if he's asked to whom these threatenings apply, he says to the clergy and to the monks. Then he compares the state of the Roman church with their own, saying the teachers of the Roman church are proud and pompous and they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and are called of men, rabbi, rabbi, but we don't desire such. As for them, they're incontinent, but all our teachers are married and live chastely with their wives. They are rich and covetous, as it is said, woe to you that are rich, for you've received your consolation. But we, having sufficient food and clothing for our support, are therewith content. They themselves fight and they excite others to war and they give others to kill and burn Christ's people to whom it is said, all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. But we suffer persecution for righteousness sake. They eat the bread of the idleness working not at all. See, this is what this inquisitor said that they said. <laughs> Isn't that something? <sighs> it's just, uh, and then at the end, having talked this way, the heretic adds, consider now, which is the better, ours or theirs? Make your choice. And many, they said, were turned aside from the Catholic faith, and they take the missionary into his house and concealed him there month after month. That's how they witnessed. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Pope John XXII launched persecutions against these believers in the more accessible valleys, and almost every pope since then mentioned their large numbers. Um, and they, they tried to get the lords of northern Italy to attack them and do all this stuff. But there was a space of grace for a while because these uh, vassals and feudal lords of northern Italy were so uh, busy trying to compete with each other that they didn't want to attack the Walden Seas. Plus, these believers were honest, hardworking good citizens in their lands and they were very productive and so they didn't want to follow the post directives and get rid of their most valuable people uh, but in other areas the the requests of the Pope did get through and so the inquisitors did attack some of the Walden Seas uh, even during the Babylonian captivity when they were uh, really busy with their internal squabbles uh, there was an inquisitor who named, named Borelli who executed 150 men, women, and children by burning them alive. And then on Christmas Day 1400, he with a small army invaded the Valley of Pergalus, which is one of the higher altitude valleys. And almost the entire population fled into the surrounding mountains and froze to death or lost their hands and feet to frostbite. And the accounts of this are still told to Walden Sea's children today. Um, in 1487, Pope Innocent VIII, who's not innocent for this, uh, launched an especially hideous inquisition against the Walden Seas. He had a papal bull, which is a papal decree, who declared them as heretics. And he gave a special dispensation to all who joined promising them remission of all their sins for killing a heretic. And it legitimized any theft of their property, and it released the participant from any oaths that they had made, and it annulled all the Walden Sea's contracts, and it forbade anyone from helping them. So, you know, these were very powerful incentives. And so it, uh, an army of 18,000 soldiers, plus a whole bunch of these crooks and opportunists who wanted to steal land because they, they had carte blanche to do so, um, they attacked the valleys from both sides. Uh, one of the armies herded the retreating inhabitants of one valley into a cave, uh, set a large fire at its mouth, and over 3,000 believers died in the cave from smoke inhalation or when they tried to escape from the sword. Just amazing. 
All these believers wanted to do is just believe God and, and have the word. Um, in the southern army, they sent a contingent of monks into the valleys to try to make converts and spare anyone who converted from the coming onslaught. No one was converted. That's amazing. Uh, now, the Piedmontese army commander was so self-assured that he made some blunders. He split up his army into many raiding parties and set them, sent them into separate valleys. And this really led to his defeat because the Walden Seas arose and the, they defeated these split contingents with guerrilla warfare tactics. In one valley, a 700-member raiding party was killed except for one who survived and ran back and told about it. Um, when the main raiding party reached the most sacred valley, that's the one where they got together once a year and had their meetings and they taught their missionaries there, the Waldenses took a stand and when the battle seemed to be turning against them, the women and the children in the rear prayed and an old guy by the name of Pierre Rivel, a believer from that valley, he drew a bow and he shot the commander of the Piedmontese army in between the eyes as he raised his visor up to shout the final attack and got him right between the eyes and it, everybody just, it just took the army and took the spirit out of the army and they started to uh, flee and then the Walden Seas turned on them from all sides. Um, just amazing. They regrouped for another assault and this time, the Walden Seas had, had um, retreated. And these valleys in the Alps, there are extremely steep hills, just like this, you know, almost 60 degree angle, just really, really steep. And so some of the, uh, the pathways into these mountain passes where the valleys are, are very narrow. And so the army from the Piedmontese went up through this one trail and they were barely able to have any more than two abreast. And the, you know, how were the Walden Seas going to be spared from this army that was coming in? And all of a sudden, fog came in and covered everything up so they couldn't see. And then the Walden Seas sallied forth from their caves and rolled huge rocks down on these guys. And um, that army, many of them were crushed by the rocks or they fell off the side into the, uh, there was a river below, or they, they crushed each other when they retreated and walked and trod upon each other. Very few of the 18,000 troops who went into the valleys to attack ever returned. Um, just amazing. And then the Protestant Reformation occurred in the 1500s. Walden Seas didn't even know about it. They were so secluded in these valleys, they didn't even know about it. And when they finally heard it, it said they were like people that dreamed. They, they didn't believe it. How could this be? It's too good to be true. And then they sent one of their pastors down into the lowlands and he returned with the incredible truths that what they had believed for centuries was now being proclaimed all across England and France and Germany and they were just overjoyed. And they joined the Reformation officially on September the 12th in 1532 and they consolidated with the Reformed Church. But that didn't stop the persecutions. In 1560, the Duke of Savoy said, go to mass or be exterminated. And so he raised an army of crooks by offering free pardon from jail for anyone who wanted to attack the Walden Seas. So you had all these malcontents and just terrible people. And um, the first night that they attacked, they were encamped, and all of a sudden they heard this drum noise from one of the valleys, and they thought, oh, no, we're being attacked in the night attack, and, there's, and they, they, they had all this melee, and they finally 
uh, um, uh, retreated, it turned out a small child had found a drum and was pounding on it just for fun. <laughs> oh, man. On Easter Sunday in 1655, a valley was attacked by uh, Marquis de Peneza, uh, who was from um, Piedmont. And this guy was just unbelievable. Uh, that day, they killed 2,000 believers. And a hero of the Walden scenes named Giannavello arose. He was like Samson. And he and five other men turned 500 attackers around to flee because they, they, they had surprised that army with such so many accurate bow shots. They didn't have guns. They had bows and arrows. And they, they surprised that uh, group of 500 with so many accurate bow shots that they thought that they were being attacked by a much greater group, so they, they retreated. The next day, uh, this De Peneza was resolved to defeat that valley. So he sent in another wave, and Giannavello, the, the Walden scene champion, and 17 others, some of them only had slings. They did the same thing to 600 attackers. The next day, because that, that Piedmontese guy wouldn't give up, they did the same thing to 800, where they didn't kill all 800. They just caused them to flee because they thought they were being attacked by a much greater force. Um, the Piedmontese commander complained that the skin of every Valois cost him 15 of his best Piedmontese soldiers. Finally, they got so angry, they, they raised an army of 20,000 soldiers, and they came in from three sides, and they crushed that valley. And on April the 24th in 1655, they tortured many of the people, especially in an especially heinous way, where they tied their hands around their knees and they rolled them off a precipice. Uh, Giannavello escaped. He went over the mountains to France and he got a group of French believers from the mountains and they renewed the attack and it was like Joshua in the Promised Land. Uh, I'll quote, the prodigies of valor that were performed by this little host. I had always considered the Valois to be men, said Des Cambis, who had joined them, but I found them lions. Nothing could withstand the fury of their attack. Post after post and village after village were wrested from the Piedmontese troops. Soon the enemy was driven from the upper valleys. The war now passed upon down to the plain of Piedmont, and there was waged with the same heroism and the same success. They besieged and took several towns. They fought not a few pitched battles. In those actions, they were nearly always victorious, though opposed by more than 10 times their number. Their success could hardly be credited had it not been recorded by historians whose veracity is above sus sus suspicion. And the accuracy of those statements, statements was attested by eyewitnesses. Not, frequent, uh, not unfrequently did it happen at the close of a day's fighting that 1,400 Piedmontese dead covered the field of battle while not more than six or seven of the Walden Seas had fallen. They were all Samsons. Such, such, such success might be well termed miraculous, and not only did it appear to the, Valo the Valois themselves, but even to their foes who could not refrain from expressing their conviction that surely God was on the side of the Barbés. The Barbés were the names of the Waldensian pastors. But the casualties in this valley had just been horrific. Many had been rolled off the cliff, tortured, horribly murdered. A mother was among them. She was rolled off the cliff with a little baby in her arms. Three days later, she was found dead but the little child was still alive. Be, it clasped between her arms, and they were so cold and so stiff that those who found them had much ado to get the young child out. 
After this news of these atrocities reached the ears of the Protestant countries, they successfully petitioned the Italian rulers to cease. And finally, on February the 17th, 1848, King Charles Albert I signed an edict granting the French Waldensians political and legal rights, allowed them to officially, and this is after the Reformation, you know, 300 years after it, allowed them to officially organize their congregations and carry out mission work outside of their territory. But the Italian side had to wait another 100 years. Their believers were even persecuted during World War II because they resisted Hitler because they uh, protected Jews. They hid them in their valleys. And also they wouldn't uh, recognize Mussolini. And finally, they were emancipated with the Italian Constitution when it was ratified in 1947. Uh, a contingent of the Walden Seas from the Cotain Alps escaped persecution in the late 19th century and emigrated to the United States where they founded Beloy, North Carolina. And our Kevin comes from there. He's related to these heroic people. So let no one again obscure the fact that the histories of those who pioneered having the Bible in their own European language and the history of the Walden scenes will forever be entwined. God bless these mountainous people for their tenacious feats of faith. The rest of the history of the French Bible begins in approximately 1110 when an interlinear Latin French version was done. Waldo's translation that he did was made 60 years later, but all of these other translations by the Walden Seas and all those other languages, we don't know when that happened, but it did occur. In 1295, Gouillard des Moines in tra translated a number of Old Testament books of the Bible uh, when he translated a history book named Scholastica History. Um, and in subsequent editions, he translated more of the books of the Bible, including the New Testament as part of this book. Uh, then in 1477, two monks edited the New Testament and excerpted it from all of this stuff in the history book, and in 1487, they published an entire Bible named La Grande Bible, or Bible. I'm not, I don't speak French, I'm sorry, I'm probably murdering these, trans, these pronunciations. I'll have to get this right and edit it in, so Nathan, you can help me with that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, all this work had been, in French, had been based on the Latin Vulgate, but then, in uh, 1523, Jacques Lefebvre de Etaples, who is a professor at the University of Paris, uh, began his study of the Bible, and he wanted to chronicle the lives of saints. But instead of finding information that venerated saints, he found truth that got him born again when he studied the Word. Uh, five years before Luther published his 95 Theses, Lefebvre wrote, it is God who gives us by faith that righteousness which is by grace alone and justifies to eternal life. Wow. Um, but he, you know, he, he did other research. He found that there was a difference between the Marys in the Bible. They all weren't the mother Mary of Jesus. There were other Marys, but that was new doctrine. It was heresy, you know. And so he started being uh, attacked by the people at the university. So he moved out of town and he fled. And then he moved from town to town where he published, he, he translated the Bible into French. So uh, Tyndale had to move from town to town when he did English. And in Spanish, they had to move, Del, Del Reina had to move from town to town and Jacques Lefebvre de Staples had to do the same thing to escape persecution. And he did a translation based on Erasmus's text. Uh, later on in 1528, he added the Old Testament. Uh, and the French clergy tried to su suppress it because it did not give credit to the Pope. 
Um, but Lefebvre was like Erasmus. He didn't want to quit the church. He wanted to reform it from within. So later on, the same Bible was edited by two Catholic priests, and they removed the offensive language, whatever that was. And so it was published and called the Louvain Bible. Uh, then, in 1535, Pierre Robert Olivitan, who was a Waldensee's barbe, or pastor, uh, he also was a cousin of John Calvin, the Protestant reformer, and a pupil of Jacques Lefebvre de, de Staples. He, for three years, secluded himself in that Angrangola, or I can't even pronounce it, Angrangona Valley, Angronia, Angronia, thank you, Kevin, um, where that was that same valley where they had their yearly meeting. It was the same valley where they had their missions trained, and there was this famous rock there inside of a building that it is said that he worked on. He used that as a table, and he translated the Bible into French. It took him three years, and it is said that he, he needed olive oil to light his lamp and so the people of the valley would go all the way down to the lowlands periodically and get the best olive oil they could so that his lamp would be lit and that gave him the nickname Olivitan and the Bible was nicknamed Olivitan after this olive oil. Um, in the preface he wrote that since the time of the apostles or their immediate successors um, the torch of the gospel has been lit among the Valdois and never since has been extinguished. Um, now, with the French translations of the Bible, no single version achieved the same degree of authority as happened in the English and Spanish and German versions. And this was due to the fact that the French language changed a whole lot during the 16th century and also because there were all kinds of upheavals, and so no one version could gain ascendancy. But, you know, you might wonder why I've digressed to cover history in this session on working the word. The reason is, is because I want to impress upon you the importance that it's, it's mandatory that we never let the truth slip again. You know, after all the, and learning about these absolutely monstrous atrocities that were committed against our brothers over the centuries, one might have a grudge against the Roman Catholics, but that would be error upon error, and it would ultimately corrupt us. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't avenge, God does. And he'll do a much better job than we ever could. And when he does so, we'll be satisfied. He's the great equalizer, and he will reward the faithful for eternity, and our martyrs will duly be compensated. We, who are the living, are supposed to overcome evil with good, not perpetuated. And also the modern Roman Catholic believers nowadays are no more responsible for the deaths of these Christian martyrs of the Middle Ages than the modern-day Jews are for Jesus. They didn't do it. They didn't commit those acts. Those people in the past did. Now, those people in the past did so because they thought it was right in God's eyes. That doesn't absolve them from the monstrous and devilish things that they did. But if you want to blame anyone for it, blame those who, regardless of the difficulties and circumstances, did not originally contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints we can clearly see that every bit by bit that they let slip had to be won back drop by drop in blood. Future generations may hold us equally responsible if we don't earnestly contend and allow any degradation to the truths that were delivered to us. Genuine doctrine is maintained by right practice. If we just hold the things that we think we know but we don't do them, we'll deceive ourselves. And that degradation will be incremental. You know, we won't be tempted to make an obvious choice between good and evil. It'll never be that clear. It'll be a choice between that which is best and good. 
So to prevent that from happening, we need to assess our motivations to make sure they're pure. Because usually the temptation to compromise will come in and be coupled with some kind of motivation for gain, real or imagined. Hence, if we keep ourselves genuine and our motives pure, we won't fall into the trap that that situation ethics based choice of the future will tempt us with. So that's why it says we should earnestly contend, not just contend. And it's not a warning to leaders only, but to us all. If we don't fulfill our responsibilities to rightly divide the word and practically apply it as true workmen and to be stewards of the mystery of God, then in the future some religious group might arise and dominate and try to crush everybody else by all means possible, just like we saw happened in Europe. We see the inklings of this today in the growing drumbeat and unbridled rage of the King James Only gang, but it, it could come from anywhere. At least, you know, in, we can thank God that in some nations there is a separation of church and state. That'll keep that from happening. But we can do something to keep that from happening if I draw my line in the sand now and I stand to, for the truth. If we do so, we will honor are martyred dead. I'd like to read to you a poem from John Milton named The Late on the Late Massacre in Piedmont. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the Alpine mountains cold. Even they who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our fathers worship stocks and stones, forget not in thy book. Record their groans who were thy sheep and in their ancient fold slain by bloody Piedmontese that rolled mother with infant down the rocks. Their moans, the veils redoubted to the hills and they to heaven. Their martyred blood and ashes sow or all the Italian fields where still doth sway the triple tyrant that from these may grow a hundredfold who having learnt thy way early may flee the Babylonian woe. Bless you.